Breaking news Monday night here on the BWI YouTube channel. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. That is Greg Pickle. I'm blindsided by this. I'm surprised by this. I don't know how James Franklin and the Penn State coaching staff and the Penn State coaching uh, and uh, and the Penn State program are, but we have some breaking news. Greg, give it to us. What's going on with the Nittany Lions? Yeah, so John Scott Jr. T. Frank, of course, came to Penn State in 2020 as a connection to Brent Pry, who he played for at Western Carolina and coached for at Louisiana uh, Lafayette. He is leaving uh, Penn State BWI. Sean Fitz confirming that on this Monday evening, February 27th. He's going to the NFL. The Detroit Lions appear to be where he is off to. So, yeah, I mean, you and I were just talking off air a moment ago. There's not a lot of hires and and departures that get made at this point of the year and this point of the process. Penn State, of course, is two weeks from starting spring ball. The Detroit Lions, of course, are busy with the combine and getting ready for the NFL draft. But they lost their former uh, defensive line coach, Todd Walsh. He went to Carolina back on February 16th. So that put them in a situation, T. Frank, where they had to look for someone to replace him. At a late point of the cycle, of course, as we just talked about, and that pick ends up being John Scott Jr., yeah, so this is a, a bit of a, a late-in-the-process situation. Greg, you and I were talking about the, the latest we could come up with quickly here. And again, we're kind of you and I are working here on, uh, on the fly a little bit, not doing a whole lot of deep research behind the scenes. But uh, I was looking up um, Josh Gaddis left on February 6th, which at that point, we, we, it was, that was a surprise move. That was late in the process. This is, this is a month later, or at least you know 21 days later. So... What situation does this leave Penn State in heading into the open contact period in March? And of course, spring ball literally around the corner. They're going to be starting in about two weeks. So is this can't be a good situation that Penn State finds itself in today. Depends on how long Penn State knew that John Scott Jr. T. Frank might be interested in an NFL job should one become available and be offered to him. So, you know, it's interesting. If you follow the coaching industry websites, Football Scoop and places like that, uh, obviously on threes, Matt Zenitz does a lot of this as well. There have been a few, a handful, probably more than most people realize, number of moves around the country when it comes to NFL staffs. When it comes to college staff, some guys jumping jobs and things like that and getting promotions. So Penn State's not the only school dealing with this right now. But you're right. I mean, the question becomes, how does Penn State move forward as it soon gets ready to host prospects again, as it gets ready for spring practice? You were about three minutes into this, T. Frank. We'll just pull the Band-Aid off and mention what many have thought uh, from the second they read the John Scott Jr. news. And then does this mean that Deion Barnes will just be promoted from his role as an analyst on the staff uh, to Penn State's defensive line coach? We'll see. Of course, he has no on-field experience yet. Penn State yeah. able to retain him on its staff by moving him into that analyst role after he maxed out his time as a graduate assistant at the end of the 2022 season. So, you know, time will tell here. James Franklin will have a plethora of options. I can guarantee you that. He talks a lot in the past and currently about always being ready for these type of things, which look more and more, I, I hate to break it to everyone, but more and more of these kind of things might happen. These late yeah. moves, especially to the NFL ranks, because number one, you sometimes have staffs that are completely full until after the Super Bowl, So that holds things up. That ties things up in terms of finalizing these staff moves. And you have guys leave for jobs, uh, you know, right before the combine between us, that and the senior bowl. And they maybe go with, uh, people and take people with them and so on and so forth. So, you know, I don't know if this is going to be something that happens to Penn State every year. I kind of highly doubt it. But across the sport, there's no question, especially especially T. Frank, as so many uh, college coaches, I think, are probably starting to think about what it's like coaching in an NFL compared to coaching in college. It's a major, yep. major difference. And we yep. just sit here and run them all down. But from a time yeah. perspective, a calendar perspective, a recruiting perspective, uh, a no name, image, and likeness perspective. I mean, the list yep. is on and on and on. And I Let's say, just stop hey, there for a second. I want to stop there on that for a second because that is a new consideration, which we we started to hear a couple of years ago. I think more in basketball with the AAU stuff that you have to deal with, but in football now, what's the difference between what it used to be in college and maybe you loved college and you wanted to be a coach on that level, but now here. Here's another responsibility of having to understand NIL, be a part of it. Um, I'm not saying it's the reason John Scott Jr. would go to the NFL as a positional coach. That is still a step up, even if you're going to be the same uh, role in the NFL for the Detroit Lions. That's a step up, but you also take that particular one off of, uh, off of coaches' plates. And I've been hearing, you know, just listening to kind of the, the landscape, 
a lot of coaches, if the, if they have the option between the NFL and college with NIL now, the NFL seems to be more and more of the choice. Do you think it's going to be an issue filling this role if uh, if if you know all of that is is a part of the conversation, or is that a step too far? No, I think that it's obviously a part of the consideration. And I think what's probably the most important thing to point out there is just simply the fact, T. Frank, that maybe your candidate pool isn't as wide or as deep as it would have been five years ago or three years ago. You're, look, it's Penn State, right? They're going to be able to get – I'm not going to say they'll be able to name the next person they want to hire if it's an outside hire. But, I mean, they will be able to attract strong candidates for this job. I'm sure that – However, this process works with whoever is the intermediary for James Franklin, you know, agents and people are blowing that person or people up right now uh, with messages and, and emails and, and phone calls and things like that, trying to get in line uh, for this opportunity, because as we well know, dating back for a number of years now, it's been a job that has produced a lot. Penn State's had very good defensive line coaches, and it's led to promotions for guys elsewhere. I mean, you can go back to, you know, Larry Johnson, of course, is now in a major role besides just being a defensive line coach at Ohio State, and him leaving, of course, was much different than any other uh, assistant coach who would leave Penn State in, in the future since then. But you look at Spencer, uh, Sean Spencer, he went to the Giants. Now he has a good role uh, in an elevated role at Florida with Billy Napier's staff. And now John Scott Jr. is moving on to the NFL. So there will be no shortage of candidates here. But, I, yeah, I do think that there's no question that a guy who may have been interested in the job uh, five years ago may now be in the NFL or is ready to go yeah. to the NFL or, you know, is not going to consider – uh, anything except for the perfect select college job and whether that's his uh, you know idea of Penn State or not you know that's uh, each individual's opinion but no I don't think we have any issue feeling this again it'll just be a question of James Franklin staying in house and just go with Deion Barnes that's obviously again what I think many people are going to talk about right now or does he go outside the program and you know I think it's important to note that whoever he does hire has a lot of work cut out for for themselves because you are replacing PJ Mustafer. You obviously have uh, – I think you have to like what you have at defensive end, but this is a big cycle for Penn State recruiting yep. life along the defensive line if you look at the scholarship chart. So when James Franklin's weighing all of these different factors, you know, remember when he was talking about the hire of Marcus Hagens and he said you have to be able to do both. You have to be able to coach and you have to be able to recruit. And they need someone that can do that. A defensive line coach is generally a very good recruiter or at least a competent one. And I think that, you know, you obviously need to be able to develop guys on the field once you get them here. So big cycle for Penn State. You mentioned the quiet period. You know, the recruiting going to open back up for visits here soon. Spring practice is on the horizon. So it's not like Penn State has to make this decision tonight, T. Frank, or tomorrow. Yeah. Now, I think if we went back through and did the math and I didn't have time to pull it up, but I think the average – Search time for James Franklin on an on-field assistant is like six days from losing the first one to hiring the next one. Now, look, that's obviously one. That you have to post the uh, the actual job at some point legally before you can just name the next person. So I think you make a good point about um, this is not this is not blindsiding or surprising James Franklin. Maybe the timing of this is different, but they have candidates in mind. And I just I want to ask you quickly going back to Dion Barnes. You mentioned uh, no on-field experience. What are the challenges of a guy who is a graduate assistant and now an analyst? What are the challenges of if they were to elevate him to that defensive coordinator role or, sorry, defensive line coach role? What is he facing? What sort of challenges would Penn State have to overcome with him in that role? Well, I think the key here is that his experience now with both James Franklin and Manny Diaz, and of course Brent Pry before Manny Diaz, in that graduate assistant role, would have him further along than somebody that, say, is coming out of a recruiting department or mm -hmm. strictly an analyst role. I mean, if you showed up to Beaver Stadium early enough, you'd see him on the field warming guys up every single game earliest usually the first coach of any kind on the field so he has on field experience there's no doubt about that I'm sure he, he had plenty of responsibilities from John Scott Jr. as that I think they they call him a graduate assistant but he was really an assistant defensive line coach for all intents and purposes so he's further along even though the resume doesn't have the on field uh, you know, one of the 10 assistant uh, titles so to speak uh, he has that experience he's been instrumental in recruiting you guys have heard uh, Nate and Sean talk about it here. Uh, Nate, Sean, and Ryan here talk about it on the channel about the, what kind of impact he has made on recruits and things like that when they've interacted with him either electronically on campus. So that's why I think there's a lot of people just going to draw this straight line, T. Frank, and say, you know what, that's what the direction uh, Penn State's going to go. I would just caution this, and that's 
how many hires have James Franklin made that the most logical, obvious, that's the way they're going to go candidate is not the one selected. I mean, I'm not sure if you could really find one uh, where that was the case, at least not Mm -hmm. from the second everyone started talking about it until the end as the reporting uh, gets underway, you get closer to finding the answer. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Obviously, you know, James Franklin, like I said, is going to have a host of candidates uh, to consider. And it's important to note again, that he does not have to do this tonight, February 27th or tomorrow, February 28th. There is no rule that says he must make this hire by March 1st. Penn State is able to get um, a waiver so that they they can have, uh, you know, if they were going out on the road recruiting an extra coach on the road, but somebody with elevated recruiting responsibilities, that's okay. Uh, They can get that taken care of until this is resolved. So, yeah, the timing of it is certainly interesting. But, you know, again, I just think that this, when not just Penn State, but just across college football, is something that's going to probably happen more than it has in the past, only because, again, when you look at the difference in the time and the lifestyle of an NFL coach compared to a college coach, it is vastly different in so many different ways. And there are yeah. guys, T. Frank, as you well know, who love that college part of it, and they are never going to go coach in the NFL. And then you have guys who uh, clearly love the NFL part of it and a college job would not appeal to them at all. And then you have the guys in the middle who love the college side of it. But as this evolution of your daily life and regular uh, lifestyle continues to evolve in different ways as things change across college football, I do think you're going to and have seen uh, a continuation of that college to NFL feeder system that maybe wasn't as prevalent before. I think it will become so. Uh, and that's why Penn State fans shouldn't be overly shocked by this yeah i know no one was talking this morning or over the weekend or late last week about this happening but you know when you really break down kind of the the beyond the first 50 seconds of of seeing the news uh and really think about it you know it it makes a fair amount of sense especially um considering some of the success of putting high profile profile guys into the nfl that uh, john scott jr has had at penn state i also want to thank Dion barnes for being a a part of the conversation because we can scratch we can scratch off so they're bringing Tom Bahali back, right? We, we, we can just skip that part of the conversation. There's no LeVar Arrington or somebody else. So name your favorite Penn State great that comes back and coaches, even if they have zero coaching experience at this point. Uh, so Dion Barnes on the staff, that is a clutch move. Um, impact at Penn State for John Scott Jr. And then we'll close out with uh, some more of the long forward-looking impact. Interesting because <laughs> this is the way it is in college football, which you just said. You're not even going to get a, a, a class through before some positional coaches are out the door to the next uh, the next yep. opportunity. I think the the biggest impact has been his ability to recruit older players in the transfer portal. He hit it out of the park with some of those names. Um, Derek Tangelo, Chop Robinson being the latest, Arnold Ebicady. They were able to identify players from other programs and able to bring in guys to make an impact at a position where you need to have mature players that are ready to go and on the football field. And I do feel like, you know, from a film perspective, Chop Robinson has great hands. He has just great hand usage. That's a positional coach thing, um, you know, in my opinion anyway. Uh, you look at Arnold Ebicady, great technician. A lot of these guys that that he has coached, you have seen positional aptitude and and, and improvement in those areas. So you know, for, I think if you look at his his time at Penn State, it's a success. You you couldn't uh, re- say it otherwise. Despite maybe some things on the resume, defensive tackle is a huge thing that a lot of fans are still upset about that there hasn't been another one technique on the roster. But what is your view? I guess that's my view. What is your view of John Scott Jr.'s time at Penn State? Yeah, he was fine. I mean, he developed some very good players that went on and have and will do very good things in the NFL. Uh, You know, again, when you go back to the conversation we had a few minutes ago, did he do enough to mix the on-field development uh, and the recruiting part of it? And I think in some areas you can say yes, and in some areas you can kind of question the the recruiting side of it. So can Penn State make a step forward there? Perhaps. You know, I think – it's easy to look at the the whole picture of someone's career and the immediacy of its ending and say, well, you know what? 
you know, Penn State didn't get this defensive tackle or that defensive end or what have you. So that defines his recruiting abilities in a negative way. But it's important to remember that what you know is sometimes better than what you don't have yet, but will know. Uh, and you just got to wait a few cycles or a few years to find that out. So, you know, I yeah. think, again, this is a big class for Penn State in the terms of defensive line recruiting. And of course, the evolution of the portal, you must be able to recruit that well. And John Scott Jr. certainly gets credit for that. So, no, I thought it was a hire that made a lot of sense when I'm sure Brent Pry and James Franklin had a lot of conversations about making it happen back in 2020. And, you know, again, uh, Manny Diaz now gets to make his first or not make yeah. but influence his first hire on this staff as its defensive coordinator. Everyone that he came uh, when he was at Penn State was already here when he arrived. So, you know, obviously this is James Franklin's call at the end of the day, but you don't have a guy like Manny Diaz on your staff and not take his input very seriously and and, and very, uh, you know, far in your decision-making process. He obviously trusts him to run your defense and be the head coach of the defense. Well, he needs to make sure that who he's working with in that position is someone that he thinks he can work with and recruit with and so on and so forth. So yeah. interesting wrinkle there. And when you're looking at some of the names that will pop up over the next few days, uh, keep whatever connections might come to him in mind. The the last thing, and I think this is the part where we've covered this ground before, so we can just say this in closing, is that the way Penn State recruits, it's a full staff thing. It's not necessarily position, position coach specific. So yeah. those relationships, they still have to develop with the next defensive coordinator. Um, and as you mentioned, a big cycle for that guy to come in. <laughs> Same thing at receiver. It's very, like, very parallel lines here between receiver. They need to get a, a good receiver class. And then, uh, of course, this defensive line class, they have some some holes and they need some obvious numbers at the position. But uh, the players that they've been talking to, uh, they have a structure in place where it's not they're not losing and going back to zero because John Scott Jr. is no longer uh, the defensive line coach, just like it was with Taylor Stubblefield at receiver. So from that perspective, they do need to get somebody uh, on the ground when recruiting opens up. They need a coach um, uh, for uh, spring practice. But as you mentioned, this doesn't have, have to happen today. We'll find out in the coming days. And when that happens, subscribe here to Blue White Illustrated on YouTube and hit the notification button so that you don't miss anything from Blue White Illustrated. Like, I don't know, randomly on a Monday at the end of February when you think all is quiet. Uh, well, no, Penn State lost their defensive line coach, and there's now a new coaching search this offseason. Keeps us busy. Uh, keeps us from finishing our dinner also so uh, i'll be going back to do that greg thank you so much for your time that'll do it right now for breaking news uh, again subscribe to blue Eyed illustrated here on youtube so you don't miss anything else